Hi everyone, uh, and this is part three on the video of the evolution of medical treatment. So that's minoxidil, right? All right. So let's come back to finasteride because the same thing holds true with finasteride. There's approved. There's uh, you know where it's uh, uh, there's off-label use of uh, finasteride in certain parts, but there's also the question of topical versus oral. Mm -hmm. Right, because oral finasteride has been around for a number of years. It stood the test of time. Uh, we've got a lot of data supporting its use. Uh, topical finasteride has become a lot more popular in uh, in, because in recent of years. The fear of side effects. Correct. Yes. And so this is the this becomes the critical yep. discussion here about it. And I, what I want to tell our audience is that the data has been with us. Mm. For 25 years. Yes. So I, I read a paper that published in 1999 that showed an almost identical result in suppressing scalp DHT levels. So with, with just a really quick uh, quick recap, because we do this, we've talked about this lots. Testosterone gets converted into dihydrotestosterone, and there's an enzyme called the 5 alpha reductase enzyme. Now at a very simplistic level, we know that, okay, there's a gene involved, but it's high levels of this DHT that can cause miniaturization of hair follicles in the condition of androgenic alopecia. It's the that primary that... trigger. Correct. Now, there are two DHT... versions of the scalp. Correct. There's two, ver... it exists in two levels. One, we have to know that there is, it's at the level of the scalp, and then, uh, at, in the plasma or within the, right. in the, in the system, in, in the serum, sorry. So it exists in two separate compartments and they're both important. Right. So this one comes from the test, testes. Yes. This one comes from the enzyme fiber for reductase in the scalp. Okay. So the testicles produce testosterone yeah. in the blood. It can go to the scalp and be converted. Yes to DHT. And this is the, this, the evidence for testosterone's involvement and then later DHT has been around since the 1940s. Yes. But obviously from a hair perspective, you know, yes, both are important, but it's going to be primarily, this is going to be the, the key that is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting, so to speak, in terms of what's happening to the, uh, the end point of the hair follicle. If I could go back in time, 30 years to use the data, or 25 years to use the data they had then, I think the campaign against finasteride that we see on the internet would be a very different, very different beast. Yeah. Because unfortunately, the dose that was chosen to treat the, uh, the men in mm -hmm. the original trials was done purely on the plasma yeah. level. And so if I just very quickly draw what the dose response curve looks like, it flattened off at 0.8 milligrams. So basically, for the company, it made it sense. It made it uh, sense for them to do it at a, at a milligram. But the data from, as I said, 25 years ago, shows that even a dose of 0.2 milligrams, right, which is like a fifth of a tablet, if you like has a similar suppressing effect on scalp DHT yes. as taking a milligram, which is crazy that you know that you would have to take a milligram to get the same effect in the scalp. Now, where this comes in, to, I know it's getting complicated, but stick with me. Where this comes into uh, into play is that we believe we believe that seventy percent of the problem is comes from scalp DHT, and thirty percent of the problem comes from plasma DHT. But the dosing only relates to the plasma DHT. And guess what? If you're only going to do your dosing on plasma DHT, well, it's going through the entire body. Yes. And that's where we have the potential for side effects. Because you know, you're putting it through your whole system. Yes. Why do you think minoxidil studies a topical treatment for hair loss? It stopped. It just wanted to treat this yep. area uh, and the scalp. So how, I mean, just pausing you for a second there, because we get a lot of patients going, well, let me measure my DHT. Let me monitor that with, with treatment. And I can find out where I am on, on this but curve. That's a plasma. Thing. Yes, correct. It's, it's, it's there's only no, measured. There's no direct way to measure scalp DHT uh, suppression. In the studies that we've seen on the suppression from topical finasteride, 
they had to do scalp biopsies. Yes. So I saw a paper recently that had been done on 249 men, which I thought was pretty impressive that yeah. they had got 249 men and, and done their scalp biopsies mm. to prove the point. So the short answer that I guess I'm getting to here for our audience is that the one milligram dose that is the recommended dose, because that's the data that was submitted to the FDA and yes. therefore went around the world, isn't necessarily the best dose for most of our patients. Yes. Right? It's not even necessary for most of our patients. It comes back to this idea of balding aggressiveness again, if you like. You yeah. know, like if I've got a young guy with a lot of hair loss, probably going to give him a higher dose. Yeah. If I've got an older man with less hair loss, I'm not going to give him a higher dose. Yeah. I'm going to give him a lower oh. dose. And so where this comes into is... Don't rule out finasteride, which is still the most significant, you know, medicine in in hair loss uh, for male pattern hair yes. loss that we've had in fifty years. Right? It's still the most significant. It could be rivaled by dutasteride. That's another story. But finasteride is the single most important advance in medical treatment in the last 40, 50 years. But it's been applied at too heavy handed approach in my opinion. So this is not flying in contradiction to what we've talked about for the last few years, right? Because whenever we've done any video on finasteride, we've talked about our practicing guidelines and, and people have been fascinated by that. We've had doctors at conferences coming and going, oh my God, that, that you know. And, but that's based on this, which is we generally, for most parts, don't prescribe a milligram a day. Correct. And the other thing to remember, and I'll remind our audience about this, that if you look at what's called the half-life of a medicine, which means from taking the dose, you measure the peak level in the blood, and then you measure the half level in the blood. So if you're measuring um, finasteride in the blood, it's six hours. Yes. If you're measuring it in the scalp, it's 30 days. Incredibly big difference between the scalp half-life and the uh, and the the blood half life. So basically, if this was an antibiotic, you'd be applying it four times. You'd be taking Correct. it four times a day. So again, one milligram once a day. I mean, I really don't quite get yeah. it. Um, but it, this has big implications for people understanding their risk because we have so many men come in and say, "I'm not going to take finasteride because everybody gets side effects." Yes. I think, well, if everybody got side effects, I'd never be writing a script. But I write over two thousand a year, so there mm. must be something not right about the yeah. fact that everybody gets side effects. So uh, I think this is, is really, it's, it's really important because, uh, and again, I don't want people to get sort of lost in the weeds or, or the technicality of, of things, which is that, okay, we are trying to optimize the dose for most people based on the fact that uh, we want to minimize side effects, but we want to also work with what we've got to make it most cost effective. Right. And we also want to make sure that we're giving the individual the most um, accurate, uh, to, for want of a better phrase, the, 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 the uh, most accurate form of the, of the active drug, yes. right? So we are saying to people that one milligram a day is probably too much. They don't need that much. We've talked about a lower dose is probably sufficient. But if we then, you know, following that train of thought and said, okay, well, one thing you could either cut the tablet into quarters and that can get a little bit messy, um, or we could compound uh, a version of that at a lower dose, but then you're worried about quality control. the quality control of that. Mm -hmm. But in this scenario, what we can do is we just don't have, we can give the tablet, the one milligram tablet that we know is made at a certain uh, standard and, and quality control level, but we can make use of the fact that it takes uh, a fair amount of time for that to be broken down. And that's why we can dose at intervals. intervals. So this comes down to patient preference. So some of my patients would be feel a lot more comfortable, particularly young men who are not used to taking anything regularly, going, well, I have to take this every day. Yes. They go, well, no, you don't have to take it every day. Mm. You could take it two or three times a week and you get exactly the same result for yes. most patients. And that's the truth of the matter. Yeah. And that, and that, Proof for pudding. I've been doing it for 27 years. Yes. You've been doing it for 15. Yes. We have exactly the same results. We know that our men that take two or three a week usually are doing fine. Yeah. Uh, there's no drama with it. So if that's your preference, because this comes back to this issue of compliance, right? What are you prepared to do for a long period of time and do it consistently? Yes. So I said to my patients, take it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example, mm -hmm. just so they get into a routine. Put it next to your toothbrush. Take it mm -hmm. three times a week. If that's their preference, that's great. If they would say, oh, that's a bit too complicated. Okay, well then we'll halve or we'll quarter the dose and you yes. can take it every day. Uh, uh, but the goal here is to not provoke the side effect. Yeah. The, the goal is to pro produce the effect. But 
because of this massive fear campaign on the internet uh, that's been supported by some poor quality medical mm. research, by the way, we have this fear to use it orally. So this is where we get into the topical. Correct, yes. So this is where the move has gone from topical, ironically, the opposite direction from minoxidil. Mm. Minoxidil started as a topical solution, has moved towards an oral yes. uh, tablet, and now we have the opposite happening with finasteride, the evolution, if you like, of the, of the treatment program. So if you think about the fact that the scalp may be responsible for 70% of the DHT that the follicle is receiving, yeah. it makes sense, in a way, to actually be more focusing on what's going on in the scalp yes. than what's going on in the rest of the body, particularly if you want to get results that reduce the incidence of side effects. So for example, the recent research has showed that if you used 0.25%, and by the way, you can use less, 0.25% finasteride in a solution is, uh, it has less than 100 times the absorption of the tablet in the body. It's very local, mm -hmm. very, very little gets into the system. So basically, patients that are getting side effects or fearful of side effects, taking it orally, can go to the topical version knowing that there's less than one hundredth of the dose going through the system, which is presumably what's going to cause the side effects. And that's different than one hundredth of the risk of side effects. I just want to make sure that... that, that well, we're, we're about to move to that. Yeah. So, so it turns out that even when you have less than a hundred percent going, a hundred times going into your system, there's the odd patient that still will react. And that just shows you that there's this idiosyncratic response to different patients yes. to have to different medicines. And there are, there are one or two handfuls of patients in my practice that can't tolerate it yep. any way at all at any dose at all because they just have an extreme sensitivity. And to be fair, we don't know why that is true. We haven't worked out yet why some people are more sensitive to the side effects than others. That's an ongoing area of investigation is to find mm -hmm. out why that might be true. But, for the, for the, but remember that in the original trials on one milligram, less than 2% of the men from the ages of 18 uh, to 41, less than 2% of them got sexual side effects. But almost as many of them got it even if they weren't taking finasteride, they were yeah. taking a placebo. And the same thing applies to all the other trials we've seen, including topical ones we've looked at recently, where the incidence of sexual side effects on people taking topical placebo, meaning nothing, was exactly the same as the incidence of sexual side effects in people taking topical finasteride. So this comes down to this psychology. If you yes. pre-think your way through this, that finasteride causes side effects and I've got to watch out for it, even people who aren't taking it claim to be getting it mm -hmm. at the same level of, yes. of, of the topical finasteride. And of course you could use 0.1% to start. And this leads us into another topic, uh, uh, you know, which is a related topic here, is that if you get the side effects on oral, for example, Mm. Then you wait, you stop, which is what I tell my patients. You wait, and then you, and mine are usually on low dose oral anyway. Yes, but then they can come back, and if they were prepared to try a topical, we can start at a very low dose of topical, like a 0.1 percent, and yes. let them do that for a month or two and make sure that they're okay, which will build confidence mm -hmm. in them. And then we can perhaps take it up to 0.25 percent, which is in theory the equivalence of one milligram oral. But that doesn't mean you need it. But that's just to give you a relative. Yes. But I mean, that reintroduction concept can also be used with the oral version as well, isn't yes. it? At a, at a, at a much, much lower, lower dose. dose. Down here. Yes. But coming back to the topical finasteride, 